Welcome to BIOS Ventures. This afternoon, we are thrilled to have Eddie Altuki, partner at PairBC, joining us. Eddie, thank you once again for joining us. It's my pleasure to be here, Chris and, and Sarah. And let's kick things off with a brief personal introduction of yourself, if that's okay. Sure, yeah. Um, so I, as for myself, I was born and raised um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I'm a big fan of the local sports teams here, um, the Niners and the Warriors in particular. Um, I actually grew up around entrepreneurs. So my my father um, was an entrepreneur here in the Valley, started um, some hard, some uh, companies in the hard drive disk um, industry. And um, my older brother as well is in biotech and um, has been a serial entrepreneur there. Um, so I've always been fascinated by startups. Um, I you know stayed locally for undergrad, went to Stanford, um, studied chemical engineering there. Um, and then I, I went straight into a PhD program at MIT um, in biological engineering. And there um, I conducted my doctoral research um, in the labs of professors uh, Bob Langer and Dan Anderson, um, primarily focused on nonviral gene therapies there. Um, and then when I graduated, um, I joined an ocular drug delivery startup that um, my PhD co-advisor had founded. Um, and I, you know, was an early employee there in R&D. Um, spent about you know, a little under two years there um, before, you know, deciding I really wanted to pivot over to the business side of biotech and, you know, came back to, to the Bay Area, to Stanford for my MBA. Um, had the pleasure of doing a summer internship um, over at Roche, where I was at the Genentech um, campus in South San Francisco, working in the partnering group there. Um, and then when I graduated um, from um, the GSB, uh, I joined um, another MIT spin out called Senti Biosciences, which um, was um, co-founded by Tim Liu and Jim Collins and focused on the synthetic biology platform for next-gen cell and gene therapies. And mm -hmm. I joined that company at the seed stage as the first business hire. Um, stayed there a little over four years um, until just a few months before the public financing um, leading uh, business development there. Um, and then after that, um, you know, now I've been about you know, six months now into my new role here at Pair VC, um, which is a seed stage uh, focused generalist um, tech firm. Um, and yeah, I'm leading leading the charge on life sciences investing here. And it's, it's been a great pleasure, um, at, you know, next step of my career. Um, and, you know, on the personal side, I, I live here in, in the peninsula in the Bay Area um, with my wife and two, I have two young boys who are three and one now. Um, they definitely always keep us on our toes. No, and congratulations uh, to your wonderful family. I, I'd be curious, <laughs> you provided phenomenal context, and it sounds like both you and your brother went the bio route. Uh, can I ask just you personally, why bio? Yeah, yeah, you know, in, in terms of my interest in bio, um, when I first started college, I think I was intent on going the, the medical route. route. So... Um, you know, I had, uh, soon enough, I, I had the experience of shadowing a doctor and seeing what it was actually like to, you know, be in a hospital and go on rounds and see patients. And I quickly realized like that wasn't me. So, um, in, in terms of my exposure to bio, you know, and, and particular research, I think I had two, two experiences, um, you know, while I was at Stanford that were really informative, um, you know, and, I'd say the first was um, I had an internship in the epidemiology department um, at the Stanford Medical School. And there, you know, we were looking at the genetics of Parkinson's disease. Um, and this was at a time when, you know, the human genome had essentially just been fully sequenced, um, you know, a few years earlier. And to me, there was a, just something really magical about, you know, now we were able to kind of map out um, you know, the genome ties some of these markers to, the, you know, the disease and start to kind of investigate what were the potentially causative, you know, associative uh, mechanisms here underlying um, the disease pathology. Um, so that, that that really kind of turned my eyes, you know, to the bio. Um, and then the second, you know, I would say that I think spurred my decision to pursue a PhD was more of like a, a wet lab um, research project, which I conducted um, at the NASA Ames Research Center um, over in, in Moffett Field. And um, that was an inter internship in nanotechnology. 
Um, so very like materials focused, um, but I, you know, got to play around, you know, at a really cool um, research institute, at, you know, the NASA Ames um, Center and, um, you know, worked on carbon nanotubes there um, that, that we synthesized via techniques like, you know, plasma enhanced carbon vapor deposition. And, um, you know, it kind of married my love of like chemistry, um, you know, playing around with materials techniques um, there with um, really cool like applications in space. Um, and eventually, you know, in terms of my decision to pursue a PhD and kind of really jump into bio, um, you know, I kind of, in some ways, maybe subconsciously like synthesized these two interests, um, you know, nanotechnology, nanoparticles, influence on medicine and health. Um, when I when I moved to Bob's lab and focused on non-parallel gene therapies and polymer and lipid nanoparticles. No, oh, as an undergraduate chemical engineer who went bioengineering in grad school, a <laughs> lot of that resonates. Yeah. And before we dive too, uh, too deep, would just love if you could also provide maybe a brief intro. You talked about it briefly, but a brief introduction to care for us. Just provide context as we think and move forward. Yeah, yeah, happy to. Um, so PAIR was started about nine years ago by um, the two two general partners here, Pejman Nozad and Mar Hershenson. Um, so Pejman and Mar, they're each, you know, exceptional human beings, uh, very different paths to venture, um, very complementary skill sets as well. Um, you know, Pageman was an amazing people person, continues to be, of course, a fantastic network, um, great pattern recognition for recognizing high quality people um, and big company opportunities. Mara was herself a pastoral entrepreneur and operator. She's very technical, you know, came with a PhD from um, Stanford and double E, um, very hands on. When they started the firm, you know, I, I think at that time there were really scant resources out there for founders to learn the ins and outs of starting um, successful companies and their vision, um, which continues to be the case, they, you know, they want to be the best seed stage investor for founders. Um, and, you know, the types of investors who would actually roll up their sleeves and, you know, help founders kind of in those critical early moments. Um, and so, yeah, the focus of the firm is really pre-seed and seed stage uh, tech companies. Um, our portfolio is really broad. Um, we cover a lot of different spaces. Um, you know, we, we have a pretty extensive focus on outreach, especially to like student founders at top college campuses uh, via our, our pair dorm and pair garage uh, programs. Um, we also run a, a twice per year um, small, intimate and hands-on accelerator program, um, which we cap off in a very well attended and, you know, we like to think highly anticipated demo day. Um, and yeah, the firm now you know, now that we've been around for some time, you know, we've been fortunate to have, you know, been in some and partnered with some really exceptional um, companies, uh, companies such as DoorDash, Garden Health, Gusto, Branch, um, and Pageman and Mar, you know, we're extremely proud of. They're, they've both been ranked very highly on, on the Forbes Midas list um, of top early investors. Um, Pair today is like almost 20 people. So it's scaled up significantly. Um, still the same vision, still the same culture and ethos here. Um, with respect to supporting founders, um, it, it's really ingrained in our in our culture. And even as we expand the team, we've done significantly um, a, a lot of growth on the on the operating partner side. So we have two talent partners now who, you know, their primary role is essentially to help founders uh, make you know those first critical early hires. Oh, it's phenomenal! And very much looking forward to learning more. And to do so, we'll pass it over to Sarah to guide us uh, a little bit more through your background. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Eddie, for those wonderful intros. With that background and context now, we'd love to dive a little deeper. After several years of academia and biotech, you returned to Stanford for your MBA, during which you interned at business development um, at Roche. I'd love to dive deep here. From your scientific training, what brought you to business specifically? Yeah, great, great question. Um, when I was a scientist uh, working, you know, in R and D at an early stage biotech company, um, you know, naturally the type of role that I had, you know, at the company, it was very execution oriented. So, you know, I was working in a team diligently on, you know, milestones that the leadership team had set. Um, you know, I, I think I kept wondering, you know, how how are these goals that we all had set? Um, you know, who decided them and how? You know, how did 
how did the, in this case, the company had been backed by some great venture investors and, you know, really incubated by them. How did they go about kind of taking a platform technology and coming up with a business plan and turning it into a company? And, um, you know, why were we focused internally on certain applications um, and not others, even though the platform was very broad? How do we make decisions about, you know, what our partnering strategy should be? And I mean, naturally, now that I've been in a few companies, I, I often see this as the case that there is a little bit of compartmentalization, right, between R&D and kind of other functions at the company, um, especially being a junior scientist um, there. I, mean, I got a little bit of exposure, but not a ton of insight into some of these, into the answers to some of these questions. Um, I really like yearn for more. Um, you know, I wanted to be in the room where the decisions happened and, you know, not only that, ho hopefully to contribute to and influence um, the decision-making process. So that that's what really spurred my um, desire to go back and get some, you know, business grounding and, and make this pivot over to the business side. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I can definitely resonate with the, uh, the, you know, being in the room where the decisions are being made. That's, that's definitely a very exciting place to be. Mm -hmm. So taking that uh, step forward, after graduation uh, from GSB, you joined Senti as head of corporate development, and you were the company's first business hire. Can you tell us more about this transition? Why Senti from GSB, and what were some of the key takeaways from your time at Senti? Yeah, yeah. Based on my experiences, so you know, up up until that point, um, I knew I really loved being in a startup environment, um, and you know, I had experienced that on the R and D side. But, you know, I hadn't yet kind of experienced that on the business side. Um, so my goal after after the MBA was to join, you know, an early stage company, um, you know, with a great team in place, exciting science and, and high patient impact, um, and to join in a business role and not an R&D role. Um, so, you know, as part of my search, um, I eventually landed on Senti Biosciences. Um, I actually got introduced um, by Pageman and Mara here at Pear. They had just invested in in Senti Biosciences in the seed round. Um, you know, they put two and two together, and you know, I was an MIT grad, and Tim was an MIT professor, <laughs> and um, and yeah, you know, for me, it was it was pretty much exactly what I was looking for. Um, you know, again, exceptional team, and Tim, and you know, his co-founder Philip Lee, um, who was the president and COO at the time, and Jim Collins, um, you know, MIT MIT being a co-founder. Um, the science, you know, I'd always been really fascinated by the synthetic biology space. So one of my interests when I was first going out and, you know, looking for a lab to join um, as a PhD student, um, you know, I loved kind of this aspect of getting better control over cell be behavior with uh, gene circuits. Um, and, you know, in terms of patient impact, um, I, I was really looking for, you know, how could we kind of advance this a technology like this and, you know, quickly get it into the clinic to hopefully benefit patients, you know, with serious diseases like cancer, um, you know, like like um, some of the other applications that our, our partnerships are focused on, um, rare diseases, um, neuro, et cetera. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. So after five years of Senti, you joined Pair mm -hmm. this past April as a partner. Was mm -hmm. venture capital the, the natural next step in your career? And if so, I'm, I'm assuming it is. Uh, out of all the firms, what prompted you to pair specifically? Yeah, yeah. You know, in in a lot of ways, um, venture did seem like the the next natural step for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been somewhat of like a winding road <laughs> to venture, but you know, in a lot of ways, it feels like the culmination in, in a career, you know, full of. Um, you know, I might even call it like deep learning to kind of borrow a word where you know, I had a lot of technical depth with the PhD um, and also, you know, very kind of practical applied drug development experience, primarily focused on, you know, CMC process development, you know, scale up, um, you know, of a GMP uh, manufacturing process. Um, so, you know, and then I kind of coupled that with the business grounding with the MBA um, internship, you know, and partnering at Roche and Genentech. Um, and then, yeah, having cut, cut you know, my teeth in, in business really at Senti Biosciences, you know, seeing the the arc of, of a company from, you know, seed and, you know, about 10 people when I joined to a little over 100 people in, 
you know, now a company that um, was was essentially public market ready. Um, yeah, I, I felt like at this point, I now, you know, approaching an, an, um, the other side of the table on the, on the investor side, I, I really have, you know, things to offer now to founders mm -hmm. and, um, and that, that's really a kind of what solidified my decision to, to jump into venture. Um, and, you know, to me, I've been amazed like the last six months, I think this is probably one of the few, you know, jobs out there where, you know, the diverse parts of my career, I feel like I'm, I am using, you know, week in and week, week out. Um, so I'm continuing, continuing to hopefully stimulate some of those neural, neuronal connections that I built up, you know, over this long road. Um, and yeah, in, in terms of the other question, you know, why pair, um, you, you know, I, I think a few reasons, uh, incredible team with Paige Man, you know, Mar and, and the rest of the, the team here, they're definitely world-class. Um, the culture was a, a huge reason. Um, you know, I love the ethos, um, you know, of the team here in terms of getting more than you give. Um, it's very mission driven around helping founders, um, you know, working hard and hustling, you know, not taking anything for granted. Um, you know, it's very collaborative, no big egos and, and politics um, that I've seen. And that to me was just quite unique, um, you know, adventure. And, you know, performance wise, it's it's been a fantastic um, run so far, you know, with the, the first three funds at pair, it's been one of the top performing seed stage, you know, firms out there. Um, there's already kind of a strong life sciences portfolio in place uh, with a couple of companies that have IPO'd, a few companies that we're, we could to be really excited about. Um, and, you know, and the last reason that I joined was, you know, having been around startups, loving kind of that, that phase of, <laughs> of um, company development. Um, I mean, we joke around here at Pair a lot that I mean, we're pretty much run like a startup. So um, the opportunity to really kind of build something um, that I hope is meaningful and long lasting with a seed stage biotech practice at Pair um, and to kind of build it up from like first principles, um, you know, in partnership with Paige Minamar and the team here was um, was a huge reason that I joined. Yeah, yeah. I think that's very interesting that Pair kind of operates like a startup. And so mm -hmm. with that, given your experiences, you know, in in various startups, how did that prepare you uh, for a career in venture? Yeah, um, I mean, I think I think probably the two aspects that, or at least the two or three aspects that jump out at me, um, you know, I, I think the R&D experience, um, which I mentioned was extremely hands-on. Um, we were taking kind of a bench scale process where, you know, we were formulating like MIGs of drug, you know, on, and kind of um, very kind of crude um, approaches, um, you know, that had just, they'd been okay for an academic paper, but they were not going to get us to kilograms of, you know, clinical trial material made um, under GMP setting um, for a phase two study. Um, you know, I have that visceral experience of, you know, what is that like operating you know, under kind of strict timelines with milestones in mind. Um, how do you deal with, you know, kind of third party um, CROs and, um, you know, partners um, to kind of get those processes in place and done. So that that um, I always keep in mind whenever I'm, you know, speaking with founders. Um, and, and, and I think the second is just the, the practical, you know, BD experience of having been you know, kind of on the cell side of, um, at a very early stage biotech, um, I just, you know, I know, I know, have now kind of learned how to think about, you know, partnering strategy, how do you run a BD process as, you know, as a very small company with tight resources, you know, who do you target, um, in terms of, uh, partners, um, you know, how long does the process take, um, you know, how do you negotiate a term sheet, um, and, you know, over the last four or five years doing this, um, I'm really fortunate to have developed a fantastic network of BD colleagues, um, you know, at, at large and medium biotechs um, across the industry. Um, I think the last thing that, you know, having been at startups, so just more on the, the soft side, I would say, is just, you know, I've been on that other side of the table. I, I have tremendous empathy for founders and operators. Um, I myself, you know, when I, when I was at Senti, I managed um, a lot of the investor relations for the Series A and Series B rounds. Um, I crafted pitch decks. I responded to diligence questions, you know, compiled the data room um, and, you know, prepped, prep board decks. Um, 
And so I, I know what it feels like, you know, kind of to go out and pitch and, um, you know, take out a pass or get to, to get ghosted. So I think that just really influences, like, how do I now go out and, and engage and interact with, um, you know, these uh, these founders that I'm meeting um, day in and day out. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly seems like venture is a, a culmination of, of all your experiences. That's really great. Do you have any advice for those who are in PhD programs today considering the same pivot to business or venture? Yeah, I mean, I think my advice is really simple. It just um, always optimize for learning is, is what I would say. Um, uh, and, you know, I've, I've heard this expression a lot lately now that I moved to venture, but I, I really believe it, um, that a little bit of slope makes up for a lot of why I intercept, right? So um, that's what I, I've always thought about it. It's changed my career. Like, how fast am I learning? And is the types of, you know, knowledge and then the people that I'm meeting, um, is this where I want to be right now? And is it, you know, taking me to a, a better spot than I was before? Yeah. Spoken like a true engineer. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I will now pass it to Chris to learn more about Pear. Oh, thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Eddie. So I, a lot of what you said is absolutely resonated. And in the biotech and life science spaces, Pear has uh, said previously that we believe no firm has yet to build the ideal pre-seed and seed stage investment partnership for founders. And with Eddie at the helm, we are determined to be that firm. That sounds like you're bringing a lot of that founder startup experience and mindset to venture and to pair. But we'd love to hear in your words uh, a little bit more about how you think about biotech investment partnership and what that means at pair. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, and no pressure with that statement that we made. <laughs> so uh, definitely is a high bar. And, um, and you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, to be serious, um, I mean, to us, what, what it means, it's a commit, commitment from Pair that, um, you know, we're striving to be the, the best investment partner out there to biotech founders within our means um, at the earliest stages. And um, you know, this partnership occurs at multiple levels and, you know, kind of thinking about hierarchy of needs, there's, there's the most basic one, which is certainly just financial, but again, it's, it's not, it's, you know, the money isn't what, what's differentiating, of course. Um, but, you know, for us, it, it's really, there's a couple of dimensions of strategic partnership, um, that, you know, now that I've, I've come on board, um, you know, I've been thinking about a lot in terms of how can I engage with founders, you know, who, who are the people that we can bring in as advisors to help, um, you know, our company founders. Um, and there's also a certain degree of just hands-on, you know, tactical and operational partnership. Um, and, you know, I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we've been expanding our operating team at, at Pair. Um, we have now kind of two great talent partners. Um, who have, you know, spent many years um, with some of the best companies out there, um, recruiting and motivating and, and keeping talent. Um, and then, you know, we actually uh, recently onboarded as well a marketing partner, um, you know, who can, who can, again, help our companies in terms of, you know, building a brand and marketing strategy and, um, and you know, creating differentiation there. So, you know, these are some of the, the hands-on and tactical you know, things that we can help with um, and, you know, maybe, maybe to kind of motivate, um, you know, kind of some, some of what I'm saying with um, a little bit more of a concrete example, um, you know, uh, previously um, Pear um, had done a lot of work with um, one of our portfolio companies, Xylus. Um, you know, Xylus was founded by three academics, uh, Shiling Shen, David Shu, and, and Hans Cleavers. Um, and, you know, initially when, when the pair team met um, Xylus, you, you know, of course, the, there was just a, a recognition and an appreciation for the extremely high quality of science um, that was being pioneered by them in this, you know, tumor organoid space. Um, you know, the, the company had a revolutionary platform, you know, they called the MLS or MOS technology microorganospheres um, enabling you know, miniaturized 3D tumors uh, to be grown from cancer patients' actual uh, clinical biopsies. 
Um, and you know, the company was bringing droplet microfluidics and robotic approaches to being able to grow up these two organoids in, in micro well plates to assay them in a high throughput way um, with applications in both diagnostics and therapeutics. Um, when the founding team came to pair, they really didn't have any previous hands-on experience with like fundraising or commercializing, you know, such a technology. Um, and as I understand it, um, you know, Pageman has told the story about the first version of the deck that they saw, you know, Pageman and Marsa was barely comprehensible, you know, outside of those with a, a very specific domain expertise in the field. Um, you know, I'm imagining something that was maybe looked more like a lab meeting presentation than an actual like pitch deck. Um, and, you know, after that point, um, the pair team worked extremely closely closely um, with the Xylus uh, founders um, as part of our accelerator program um, and, you know, really hone kind of what was, what was the narrative, what was the story, what, you know, what was the business plan um, going to look like? Um, and, you know, very, you know, fortunately, Xylus has had great success. They've gone on to raise, um, you know, $3 million seed round, uh, 70, you know, $90 million now um, A round. Um, and, you know, continue to be huge supporters of the Xylus team. No, oh, and Xylus is certainly a company we, we love to tout, uh, also being investors here at Alix. But by the same token, Eddie, that's, that's phenomenal. And it's a really great example, as you said, a concrete way to demonstrate how you think about partnership. And I do want to talk more about portfolio support and engagement a little bit later. You've brought up a couple points now. But yeah. uh, that I want to dive deeper into. But to, to start, you also mentioned engaging at the earliest stages. And yeah. in your role uh, on the Parabio team, you focus on partnering with entrepreneurs from day zero to build these sort of category defining companies, like in the uh, tumor organoid space with Xylus, as you just described. So, how does Pair, considering that, and considering the breadth of potential space, how does Pair think about developing investment theses? select where it's exploring and where it partners and if you have a few areas uh that you're focused on maybe a number of areas can you share what some of those are today yeah yeah great question um a, lo a lot of potential depth we can get into there so um yeah i'll do my my best to summarize um you know i think at, at the highest level as a firm you know what's common to us is that you know we, we certainly really, really focus on strong teams, uh, differentiated tech platforms and large market opportunities. And, you know, it doesn't kind of matter whether it's biotech or, you know, fintech or um, web three or what have you. I mean, that, that that's like kind of the common denominator among all those. Um, so in, in terms of how we think about opportunities, you know, in the life sciences, kind of just translating that out, um, you know, the types of companies we've we've tended to invest in and continue to be excited by, um, we look for you know really strong technologists at the helm, um, you know people who we we know kind of understand um, the uh, the technical side better than anyone, you know just about anyone out there, um, but they also need to be fast learners, you know people who we think can scale and and grow with the company and have of course kind of the degree of grit and. Um, and big vision that's necessary, um, you know, to be in that in a CEO role. Um, so, you know, and then on the on the platform side, what again, what we really look for is you know broadly applicable um, tech driven platforms um, with multiple opportunities, you know, for both internal program development and and also partnering. Um, and you know, the opportunities again, I mean, they need to be significant. Um, for us, you know, to 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 really um, to dive in and, and get excited. Um, in terms of what's in scope, you know, at, kind of cover a pretty broad charge here at um, at Pair. You know, we we're interested in opportunities across therapeutics, diagnostics, life science tools, and, and software. Mm -hmm. um, we don't invest, you know, in terms of what's out of scope. Um, we wouldn't do kind of single asset companies. Um, you know, our, our portfolio size in life sciences is naturally going to be on the smaller side, given that we have a, a generalist um, scope at the firm. So, um, you know, the single asset plays kind of don't make as much sense, um, given just what our, our number of, of investments are. Um, we also don't, you know, tend to do med tech or med devices. Um, those, those tend to be out of scope. 
Um, and then in terms of like theme themes kind of within life sciences, our portfolio to date, um, you, you know, just by dint of, you know, kind of the platform biotech focus, we've had, um, you know, some overlapping themes around, you know, omics for sure. Um, I'd say precision medicine, uh, synthetic biology and, you know, AI being applied towards, you know, oncology and aging. So just to kind of give some examples, um, you know, in, in our portfolio, garden and foresight, you know, in the liquid biopsy space, um, you know, focus on genomics and precision medicine. Um, I would say Xylus, you know, Senti and BioAge Labs are kind of broadly in this space of, you know, better precision med medicine approaches, um, you know, across cancer and aging. Um, and then, you know, Valor Labs is kind of another example of, um, is a pair accelerator company, now seed stage, um, you know, they they kind of really hit on the AI and, and precision medicine themes as well. Um, so, yeah, and in terms of what, what we continue to be interested in, I think it's really, um, you know, platforms that are leveraging um, large, you know, proprietary human first data sets, um, you know, especially based on the better measurement techniques that, you know, life sciences um, are now afforded with, you know, omics approaches and, you know, single cell um, methods as well. You know, that sort of integration of software, hardware, wetware to improve biological understanding, offer a very uh, advantageous feedback loop to deepen understanding and bring bring the platform and the company forward. Couldn't agree yeah. more. And that's why I think tech bio is so exciting today. And so yeah. I think a lot of that makes sense. And you you expressed some concern about being able to summarize, but I think you did a phenomenal <laughs> job. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> And so taking things a step forward, you've given us a great overview of the team. You've given us a great overview of how uh, you support companies and how you invest across both different stages and areas of bioinnovation. So you've talked about this a bit, but would love to just really ask the question to you directly and, let, and to allow you to respond. How do you differentiate there? And in doing so, develop domain expertise to engage with uh, your portfolio companies and really help them move forward? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, you know, maybe to summarize, I think some of the threads or, you know, themes that I've been hitting um, a bit earlier, but, um, you know, in terms of differentiators, I think there's a few axes on, on which I think about it. So, uh, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, differentiation needs to come from the people, you know, themselves that, Founders, when they pick up an investor to go with, I mean, at the end of the day, it's they're picking someone who they want to be supporting them, you know, through thick and th thin. Um, you know, in many cases, founder-investor relationships they can, you know, last longer than you know marriages. So, um, so you know, the the first point of differentiation is just you know team that um, I you know feel very fortunate that at Pair we have exceptional individuals here. Um, very diverse backgrounds and sets of domain and functional expertise. Uh, many of us have been, you know, deep um, deep operators in the space and founders ourselves. Um, so I, I, and I think that's definitely kind of number one and, and you know most important. I think too, um, culture. Um, you know, I, I mentioned this before, but you know, again, I, I do think that a pair. Um, you know, we think of our, our culture as being one of a startup. Um, you know, all of our, our team members were, you know, were hustlers, were high, high energy, um, very collaborative and, and mission driven, um, you know, and high, high performance, low ego is kind of what we, <laughs> we strive for as the ideal here. Um, and then, you know, last and not, not least, um, company support, you know, how could we understand, in, you know, at each stage of the company's life, there are kind of different important existential questions that need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at each round, there's going to be kind of a syndicate of investors and, you know, you want each investor in your round to be value add. Um, so I think a lot, and, you know, now that I've been here about six months, this has been one of my major, you know, imperatives here, you know, with within that context of, you know, we're investing in the pre-seed and seed. What are some of the major unmet needs kind of in this space um, that I keep hearing from founders that pair can come in and, and address. Um, 
So, you know, on that point, I think we're doing some great things already. Um, there's a lot that I want to build up, you know, at pair in terms of capabilities. But, you know, I've mentioned kind of the ability to offer, you know, our support on company strategy, on business development, you know, both in licensing and out licensing, um, you know, uh, uh, scale up um, and growth of, of the company as well. Um, you know, I've lived through all that myself, you know, at the leading corp dev at, at a biotech um, from seed to to a public financing. Um, I think storytelling and, you know, fundraising, because we, you know, in most cases, we are looking for strong technologists at the helm. Um, you know, our, te our team has been really great, about, you know, to date, um, and I hope we could continue this, um, about partnering with these technical founder and academic founders and, being able to digest the science and, you know, turn it into a narrative that, you know, we hope is broadly appealing <laughs> to many types of investors. Um, and then I've talked a little bit about kind of the people management and recruiting capabilities that our firm um, is is growing. So the two talent partners, I'll just, um, you know, put in a shameless plug for, for them. But uh, Matt Birnbaum, um, he previously led all of recruiting for Instacart. Um, so actually grew that team from 300 to 3,000 during the early days of the pandemic <laughs> um, was managing a team of a hundred recruiters and, you know, he has a phenomenal background and, you know, every time we put Matt together with our, our founders um, it's been, been amazing kind of seeing what, what he's been able to do. And, you know, we're, we're really excited by um, a second talent partner that we onboarded um, recently, Nate Hirsch, um, who had come to us from, you know, Facebook meta um, and before that Uber um, and, you know, has just been in a variety of, of uh, senior recruiting roles um, at both those companies. Um, and then, you know, the marketing support as well. Jill, Jill Puente, um, she's fantastic, you know, joined us from 10 plus, uh, joined us after uh, 10 plus years working in um, marketing and, and brand management roles at Google. So. I absolutely love that you focused uh, so much on your differentiation on people. There are certainly ways to help companies that come to specific skill sets and backgrounds, but people and culture and finding that fit, I think, is more essential than many give it credit for. So, yeah. Now, taking this in a slightly different direction, uh, and we've talked about this a bit, but historically, the philosophy of investment in tech has been pretty different from traditional biotech. And we've already touched briefly on um, the difference between sort of tech bio, single asset biotech. Yeah. And in recent years, we've been seeing that tech bio movement increase with the convergence of technology and biology to develop the platforms we're talking about. So in part, this is that famous uh, part of the famous statement that uh, software is eating the world. <laughs> and so yeah. as we think about this, um, can you share more maybe about your thoughts on this trend? We'd love to hear your thoughts on the frontiers of computation, having their impact in tech bio, the life sciences, healthcare, maybe even digital health today. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I'm super excited about that convergence, um, as you mentioned, and um, you know, in terms of where I'm, I'm seeing that that um, convergence kind of happen and you know make a difference in the field. Um, probably the the biggest story. You know that was relevant earlier this year. Um, that you know was was just so impressive was uh, DeepMind. Um, you know Google subsidiary um, turning you know its incredibly accurate protein structure prediction algorithm um, al AlphaFold on you know nearly all catalog proteins that are known to science, like two hundred million of them, and then sharing the results publicly. Um, you know I just I've already kind of seen it. Um, with some of the the companies that are pitching to me that in their pipelines, they're starting to kind of already make use of some of these resources. Um, so I'm, I'm fascinated to, to see kind of where that, that goes. Um, you know, on, on the subject of, you know, applying AI ML to, you know, life sciences and healthcare, um, you know, I'll throw another plug out to um, one of our pair portfolio companies. You mentioned them earlier, but Baylor Labs. Uh, you know, so kind of thinking about a convergence of, um, you know, computer vision approaches with digital, you know, pathology there. Um, Valor, just to kind of tell a little bit about the story, uh, was started by a, a brilliant young team of um, Stanford students. They were conducting research um, in the Stanford ML group um, led by Professor Andrew Eng. And the, the team realized that, um, you know, even after 
significant advances in the understanding of cancer genomics. Um, you know, oncologists today, they, there's still a lot of uncertainty with respect to therapeutic selection. Um, and, you know, they realized that pathology could be an unta untapped modality in cancer care where, you know, these, these images are routinely collected, but are we really kind of leveraging them, you know, in the best possible way for patients? Um, so at, at Valer, you know, again, they're, they're using computer vision approaches um, to discover, you know, new biomarkers. Um, and, you know, with the goal of, of just, um, you know, making some of these hard decisions about a, a cancer patient's therapy in a much uh, more informed and, um, you know, unbiased way. Um, so, you know, a specific example, they, they presented at ASCO earlier this year, um, you know, basically in, in the area of pancreatic um, ductal adenocarcinoma, um, you know, showing that um, that basically the AI approach to, um, you know, that just utilize routine histopathology, that they could actually ID features um, correlating with treatment outcomes um, for these PDAC patients. Um, and the classification performance there was actually better than, you know, validated treatment prediction tools that are out there based on manual, you know, pathologist assessment. So the, the team is continuing to advance and, and take this forward. John, it sounds like you're doing really incredibly exciting work. And by the same token, I'm excited to see, as you say, more of this convergence. And at the same token, I'm hoping, and we're starting to see it a bit, but I'm hoping the phrase soon changes to bio eats world. So yeah. <laughs> let's, uh, let's all help it. All of us who are helping and move these companies forward, help it get there. And Sarah, I would love to pass it back over to you to dive deeper into PEAR's uh, diligence process and uh, how, how they engage post-investment. Post uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. So building on that portfolio overview and, and how you put it, digesting the science, you and your team has made, uh, have made some incredible investments into companies like Garden, Osmine, Senti, and Xylus, perhaps using one or more of those companies as examples. How do you separate signal and noise when evaluating companies? And could you share a little bit more about Pear's diligence process? Yeah, yeah, happy to. Um, you know, I've I've only been at Pear a, a few months, so um, you know, I I probably won't um, pick on. I could pick on an example, but not having been you know kind of around at the time of the, of the diligence, um, yeah, you know, I'll probably just speak a little bit more generally about our our process. Um, I've made a few investments to date, but um, none are yet kind of publicly disclosed. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be hearing more about, um, you know, these teams and companies soon. Um, but yeah, just, you know, at a high level, I think what we focus on here, alluded to it earlier, but we really prioritize top teams, you know, the people who are kind of the 1% um, in terms of, you know, kind of where they are with respect to the field, um, the understanding of the science and, and the tech. Um, you know, again, we really focused on, on that leading edge, um, you know, of science. Um, so, you know, we look for our platforms that we, we think are, you know, revolutionary and not evolutionary, you know, 10 X better kind of performance. Um, if it's not obvious to us, then being, you know, kind of a, I would say, um, the benefit of being at a generalist, you know, slightly more opportunistic firm is that, you know, we can make some of those calls early and, um, you know, really be selective with respect to what are the types of platforms that we're investing in. Um, and, you know, I mentioned it before, but, you know, big market opportunities, um, you know, that make, make ultimately for big companies. So we think about, you know, markets that, you know, we see as being, either, you know, large and, you know, today already um, with kind of high unmet needs and the ability to come in and um, own a significant, you know, chunk of that space or, you know, smaller markets, but they're, that are just like growing um, tremendously. Um, and, you know, in terms of just platform, you know, just to say a little bit more about that, I think, um, you know, we, we do think about the platform is needing to be like broadly applicable. There needs to be the chance for like multiple shots on goal um, with that platform. Um, and there needs to be some line of sight to, you know, in many cases, this is often a challenge that, that I see, you know, kind of coming out of academic technology that there was maybe like one or two kind of POC, POC applications that was good enough for a published paper. Um, but in terms of, you know, that particular hammer, 
you know, is there some line of sight towards like males that actually, you know, deserve <laughs> hammering, um, so to speak, just, I mean, given everything that um, it takes to commercialize, you know, a, a platform to, um, you know, bring it, bring it through the clinic, uh, clinic in many cases and, and get it to market. Um, you know, what, what are the nails that should actually be prioritized there? Um, so, I mean, we do like to, to see that line of sight towards, you know, applications that make a, a ton of sense um, scientifically and, and from the business side as well. Um, we definitely look for like traction um, and, you know, traction can come in, in the form of many signals. So it could be papers, you know, it could be really strong IP um, that's been filed, you know, good POC data, um, you know, investor and, you know, partner interest um, as well. Um, you know, we I, kind of speaking again to the the fact that we look at these platforms and want to invest in ones that are more revolutionary. We do do tend to favor here at Pair kind of bolder visions and missions. So you know, we want to aim for an expression I learned from from Roche: uh, first in class and or best in class is kind of the um, the strategy that um, you know I've seen it too too many times. It, there's a lot of companies that you know they they may have great platforms, but they their lead program might just be at the end of the day, kind of me too. That's maybe marginally differentiated. Um, and then, you know, just to kind of round this out on the people side. Um, I mean, where he, we, we know, and one of the things we like about tech bio is kind of the emphasis on founder led bio. And, um, you know, I think, I think we've been saying this more, but, you know, the pair portfolio, many of our, very, we're very proud of, of many of our portfolio company founders. Um, they've been able to like lead the biotechs and scale them um, through many stages of growth uh, and kind of gain the skills necessary at each of those stages. Um, and, you know, we also, again, kind of look for teams that are diverse, um, kind of both in background and, and perspective and thought. Um, so, you know, those tend to be some of the factors that we, we assess. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that for that overview. Taking this a uh, slightly different direction, Pear also gets involved in helping new co-formations through its accelerator. And you've talked about wanting to help um, and wanting to work with great technologists who, who are rapid learners, work in areas mm -hmm. of high unmet need, and building broadly um, applicable platforms. So taking that a step forward, could you tell us more about Pear's view on incubation? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um... And I just want to kind of clarify a little bit. Um, well, the the companies in our accelerator program, you know, are definitely early. Um, the program is like not quite incubation. So teams do come to us, you know, fully formed. Um, you know, we're not the, the type of firm that's, you know, pairing kind of a scientific founder with um, an EIR or kind of a business founder, um, you know, and br bringing them in. Um, and, you know, so that's kind of like one just point of clarification. Um, and th these companies that come to us in the accelerator, they, you know, they may pivot, but usually there's some framework in place in terms of like an initial product concept or, you know, market opportunity. Um, so, you know, we haven't done kind of a, a true company incubation, um, kind of in the sense that, you know, might be um, referred to in the field um, within biotech. Uh, but that said, you know, it's something that I think about and, you know, I'm open to it. Um, you know, we do see opportunities that come up on occasion, um, you know, even in the last few months that I've seen um, where there may be kind of technologies available for licensing that are, you know, very interesting. Um, you know, of course, we we have the fortune of um, meeting many stellar people, you know, some of whom could be an exceptional EIR. Um, so we're, we're open to it. Um, and, and yeah, so just to maybe to say a little bit more about the accelerator program and to the question of how do we work with our companies there, um, that's really kind of, we think of it as just a very intensive boot camp um, that we run, you know, twice a year. It's a very intimate program. Um, typically only a dozen biotech companies, or sorry, a dozen uh, companies per batch, um, kind of across all areas. Um, in past cohorts, we've we've typically had about one or two biotech companies um, in the mix. Um, you know, there's a lot of hands-on uh, support and mentorship from the pair team, you know, including from the general partners here. Um, you know, we we help them in terms of 
um, you know, thinking through company company vision and strategy, um, customer development, go to market, um, and fundraising. Um, and yeah, yeah, just uh, in terms of the biotech companies that have been in the mix, um, you know, I mentioned Xylus um, was one of them. Um, Valor, you know, which which I referenced was um, a second. Um, you know, last um, cohort we had um, Interface um, Bio, um, which is a um, microbiome focused um, drug discovery company um, in the mix. Um, and you know, based on the experiences so far, I think we found there there is much that transfers over um, to bio, where you know I don't think it's emphasized as much in you know in some of the biotech. Um, you know, kind of company best best practices, but I think they should be um, some of these general principles. I mean, it kind of doesn't matter what type of business business you're running. Um, you know, the the principles do carry over. Yeah, certainly. In addition to the accelerator program uh, for students, Pair has its dorm programs, um, the garage, the competition, the fellows program. So, yeah. how do you think about encouraging you know the next generation of bio entrepreneurs? Yeah, yeah, we're very passionate about this topic. Um, and actually, you know, you mentioned some of the great programs we have, like like the Pair Garage, the Competition, um, the Fellows. Um, this past June, we, we actually hosted a PhD Founder Summit um, that was, you know, really targeted at entrepreneurial PhD students and postdocs. Um, and, you know, we, we held this um, half-day summit um, here at our headquarters in Menlo Park, um, and, you know, filled, filled the half day with fireside chats from successful PhD founders. You know, we had a VC panel on fundraising um, and, you know, importantly, it just created some space and, and an opportunity for, um, you know, these founders to network and learn from each other. Um, and, you know, I, I was actually unsure kind of how this experiment was going to go when, you know, when we first um, planned it and, and started marketing it. Um, but yeah, we were blown away by the enthusiasm and drive, um, you know, from the attended, attendees for this kind of content and, you know, community. Um, so as a result, we're, we're working hard to follow up with more such events. Um, you know, again, we, we've tended to back a lot of, a lot of these um, you know, technical entrepreneurial founders coming out of, you know, top, top universities and, and labs and, um, yeah, we, you know, we'll continue to be excited about, um, you know, making sure that they're inspired, that they have the resources to, you know, go out and believe that they themselves can, you know, start the next great company and, and translate their, their science, um, to the broader, you know, masses. Yeah, that's a very admirable initiative, giving back and and being able to mentor um, people outside of you know the portfolio companies as well. Pass it on to Chris to to ask more about that that portfolio support that Pair offers. Thank you, Sarah. And as we as we think about this, Eddie, it's clear that Pair in many cases puts people first and cares a lot about uh, the team, the culture, and thinking about those. Um, elements that go beyond just mm -hmm. the technical. And not only are you helping with a lot of those and you've highlighted phenomenal ways of supporting companies so far, but I'd like to take it in a more specific direction, especially as we're thinking about the lengthy life cycle of life science and healthcare companies and in the tech bio space, especially where we're seeing an increasing interdisciplinarity of tech and biotech and bringing those teams, bringing those cultures together especially because you're getting involved early and you're providing this sort of advice and mentorship. How do you think about advising founders and supporting interdisciplinary teams to grow and build sort of long lasting uh, company cultures? Yeah, um, a very important question, um, as you highlight, especially in, in our space here. Um, I, I think the, the way I think about it, I'm, I'm really inspired by the most recent experiences that I've had. At uh, at Senti and and also at Pair, um, so at at Senti Bio, just to kind of lay some context on on what that experience was like, um, you know, when I first joined, we were um, you know one of these scrappy startups that were just operating out of the J Labs incubator space in South San Francisco. Um, you know, we we didn't think too much about company culture at the beginning. <laughs> we just you know basically showed up to work. We worked hard. You know, we were all excited and motivated by the 
the quality of the science and, you know, the team and the vision. Um, and, you know, we were just, um, you know, basically coming, coming in um, day in day, and day out and kind of rolling up our sleeves and, um, you know, getting whatever job needed to be done, you know, that day um, and, you know, doing it um, with, without much fanfare. Um, and, you know, I, I knew that having just basically come off an MBA, I would say, and joining a team of pretty much all, um, you know, technical folks, um, you know, people who were previously in industry or, you know, had to come out of postdocs or undergrad um, as researchers. I knew that if we were to succeed in our mission and, and scale as an organization, um, you know, we would need to align on a culture and, and values that, you um, would make sense for you know given our mission and and the diverse perspectives that we had on the team um so actually at the we had ended up um hosting kind of a first offsite um for the company a few months after i joined and i worked with the coo um to to plan a brainstorming session um with the whole company at that time which was probably about a dozen people um just to figure out you know who who we, were we like who was antibio you know how did we think of ourselves um, and who did we strive to be? Um, and, you know, we basically took all the data there, um, you know, tabulated, it was, just, you know, everyone could provide their input and perspective, you know, from the CEO to, you know, leadership team all, all the way down to the most junior, you know, research associate. Um, and from that input, there were like very definite themes <laughs> that emerged. Um, you know, I didn't take any AI or ML to figure it out, but, um, you know, the, the four qualities that emerged from there, they were like collaborative, intellectually curious, intrinsically motivated and empathetic. Um, and, you know, when those four emerged, I think everyone just kind of had an aha moment of, okay, this just really describes, <laughs> you know, kind of uh, how we all are at, at Senti and who we strive to be. Um, and, you know, we aligned that, that we would use those as a, you know, as a framework um, for our culture going forward. Um, so, yeah, I'm very proud of the fact that, you know, that that early initiative, you know, kind of stayed with the company. Um, you know, I think even until today that those attributes are actually, and I hope I'm not giving anything away here, um, you know, as you, I used as part of the interviewing process, you know, we were in candidates uh, based on you know, the team's impression of how did they stack up um, on those dimensions. Um, you know, and so I think it's really important for these startups. They can kind of get um, certainly, you know, into this world of just the day-to-day -day and, you know, just getting caught up in the science and the next, you know, POC experiment that needs to be planned and, and done and, you know, optimizing the PowerPoint slides and such. But, um, I, you know, I think if, if these companies can kind of take a moment, um, come up with a, you know, conscious, hopefully inclusive effort to define and um, and then to, you know, live by values. Um, I think it's one way of ensuring that there's some degree of continuity, you know, as the company scales, um, that there's, a, you know, kind of uh, threads within this, you know, tapestry that's all being, you know, woven together um, that continue for, for the long haul. Um, and so, yeah, at Pear, you know, I've mentioned that culture was a big reason that I joined, but, um, you know, I've, I, it's been, um, you know, fantastic being such, uh, being part of such an inter interdisciplinary team. Um, you know, it, it is one of the reasons that I joined Pear that we weren't all just kind of drinking the Kool-Aid of, you know, being only within life sciences or only kind of having one thesis <laughs> and everyone kind of has to believe that. Um, so, you know, when I look at opportunities, um, you know, it's fantastic to, to be able to work from, work with, you know, my colleagues here who have such different perspectives, they have insights to be gained from other industries they, you know, they have particular skill sets, you know, I am not an MLAI expert, you, you know, I see a lot of AI, you know, companies that come our way, but we have a colleague on the team, my partner, Rush, um, who's really deep in that space and, you know, we can work together and, um, you know, make sense of some of these opportunities. Um, so that, that's something about the culture and, you know, everyone has different backgrounds too. Um, it's, it's been fantastic to, to be a part of. And I absolutely love that example and the intentionality with which com culture was built uh, back when you were at Senti. And, and you, you brought this up uh, briefly there as well, but a point today, and very rightly, I think we'll all agree, is the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion, access. 
uh, of yeah. founders of boards and broadly of teams, but especially um, the founders and the boards who provide signal to the rest of the company. And so given uh, you see and support companies from those earliest stages and recognizing that it's not really our decision as VCs, but we can provide support for founders who are seeking to incorporate these sort of DE and I practices into team building. Do you have any thoughts on how uh, we as VCs can really assess and provide support in those ways? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, I, I think VCs really need to lead by example um, here. Um, you know, it's not just about kind of saying words, but it's about kind of living, um, you know, actions and, and following through on them. Um, you know, I, we certainly at, at Pair believe um, talent is is equally distributed, but access to opportunities aren't. Um, and so I've been very inspired just by everything our team here is doing. And you know, I hope to carry the torch on, on all of them. But, um, you know, at, at Pair kind of, the diversity is kind of woven into our story where Paige and Mar, you know, they have incredible backstories. Um, you know, I find that their stories really resonate with founders of all stripes that, you know, Paige Mar was an immigrant from Iran, you know, originally came to this you know country, not speaking much English, not, you know, many resources or a network to speak of. Um, but, you know, eventually um, through fits and starts, you know, built up an amazing career um, and, you know, and became a, a top seed seed investor. Um, and then Mar, you know, she was an, um, an immigrant from Spain. Um, she was actually one of only two female PhD students in the electrical engineering department at Stanford, you know, back in the late 90s. And, um, you know, for her to go out and start a company out of her PhD was pretty much unheard of for a female, you know, entrepreneur. Um, but, you know, she defeated the odds and, you know, ended up becoming a very successful um, you know, leader, leader of a company and a, a repeat entrepreneur as well. Um, so the two of them, you know, we, we are inspired by their personal, you know, stories and, um, you know, scrappiness and, and, you know, the odds that they worked against, um, and, you know, very differing, um, backgrounds and, and circumstances. Um, and they've really built up a diverse team around them, um, that, you know, again, we're, we're all, all quite proud of. Um, the, the other specific initiatives that, you know, I mentioned, um, uh, Mar herself is a co-founder of the Equity Summit. Um, and that, that's an annual gathering, um, that brings together, you know, uh, thought leading uh, LPs and GPs for off the record conversations. Um, the goal there is to drive industry change and produce more investments in, um, in women and underrepresented minority, um, founders. Um, and then my partner, Vivian at Pair. Um, she's been running, um, I think for at least a couple of um, iterations now, uh, our female founders uh, circle program. And that's really like an intimate founder circle of um, technical female founders, of female engineers. Um, and, you know, it bring, brings um, um, these individuals together for, you know, a sense of a community and bonding and, um, and there's a number of sessions and workshops that are planned, um, you know, successful female founders and leaders, you know, come in to, um, to give talks. Um, and so it's, that, that's been like a very successful initiative that, um, you know, we've been proud to support at PAIR. Um, and yeah, I mean, in terms of our own hiring, I think we absolutely consider the diversity of, you know, backgrounds, of life experiences and perspectives, um, what we think about hiring. So you know, and I think same thing when we think about backing companies too, you know, I, I think we think about, you know, in each accelerated cohort, you know, do we have the right amount of diversity? Um, you know, we, so again, it's, this is kind of has been imbued with, you know, from the very beginning at Pair and, um, you know, it's an area that we're very passionate about. Really exciting to see a firm starting that way from the very beginning. And also, as you say, uh, practicing and learning to bring those practices forward and, and share them with portfolio companies. Passing it off to Sarah to discuss very briefly our last topic on catalyzing bioinnovation and to hear your thoughts on what's coming next. Okay. Yeah, I'm really excited for this one. Yeah. Let's see. So from the beginning uh, of your time with Pair, you've had um, a future forward and tech enabled investment perspective. So out of those kind of investment opportunities and perspectives, what have you been seeing from founders in terms of the next cycle of emerging technologies? 
we'd love to hear what you're you're most excited about. Yeah, yeah, I think um, what I, what I've been most excited by um, a few different themes I'd say. Um, you know, one I you know I mentioned human first. You know, platforms informing. Um, you know, drug or, or biomarker development. Um, so, I mean, that that's an area that I'm I'm very excited about. Um, I talked a little bit about Xylus, um, you know, with the human, um, you know, tumor uh, mi micro organosphere technology um, that they're developing. Um, you know, huge implications on in terms of diagnostics and and therapeutics. Um, you know, interface bio is also you know taking a human first approach in terms of looking at the actual like human gut microbiome and skin microbiome and, um, you know, trying to understand kind of what are the um, immunomodulatory, um, you know, uh, metabolic um, uh, components that, um, you know, could actually be used, um, you know, as drugs where, you know, you already kind of have um, the safety kind of factor built in with, you know, these are components that the uh, these bacterial species are already producing. Um, and we know kind of through, um, you know, recent experiments, the impact of the microbiome kind of makes in, in terms of modulating immunity. Um, so it's a, it's a really exciting approach in terms of um, the pipeline that they're building to, um, you know, actually uncover and and identify and develop these drugs. Um, a second area, you know, I'm very excited about, um, I mentioned it already, but AI being applied, you know, broadly to, to healthcare, especially, you know, support to oncologists and, you know, other doctors um, in terms of decision-making for patients. So the Valor Labs, um, you know, I've, I've spoken a little bit about them, um, but I continue to be excited by, you know, that being, um, you know, more broadly kind of translated and, and felt um, in healthcare. Um, and then a third area I would, I would mention is just the next wave of genomic medicines. Um, so, you know, I've, I've had a lot of experience in this space from, you know, the time that I did my PhD in, in non-virology and therapies, um, my time at Senti working on, you know, programmable and controlled um, cell and gene therapies. So, um, you know, right now I feel that the field is, um, you know, undertaking just um, a massive number of, of bets, you know, with respect to, you know, new targets, improved payloads. Um, you know, whether that's kind of, um, you, know, you know, more um, editing based approaches or, or otherwise, um, and then, you know, better delivery systems as well. So I'm really excited to, you know, see this wave of, of medicines enter the clinic and to start getting data back um, to inform, you know, you have the, the next generation of medicines. Um, you know, lastly, I think precision medicine is an area I'm, you know, I continue to be super excited about. So being able to, you know, use biomarker guided. Um, you know, drug drug development is a principle um, in medicine so that, you know, we can much better tailor, um, you know, the therapeutic approach to the patient's um, actual disease. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Turning that around, you know, is there anything that you're bearish on? Or in other words, areas you might think are not ready for the prime time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think... On that one, you know, I would probably echo comments from, you know, others in the, in the field that, um, you know, I, I would love to see platforms that go after targets and indications that, you know, they can uniquely address um, rather than, you know, all too often I just see companies with really innovative platforms just taking like a less risky, you know, me too play of, you um, you know, and say a new antibody platform and their first target is HER2 and, you know, a cell therapy company and it's CD19 and BCMA at the top. Mm -hmm. um, you know, gene therapy companies going after hemophilia or DMD. And yeah. I mean, they, there's certainly unmet needs in all those spaces, but I would love to kind of, you know, see companies going head on at, at challenges that are just inadequately addressed right now. And, you know, maybe it's their platform that can, you know, make all the difference and, you know, patients are waiting now, so. Yeah, very well said. So what's coming next for Pear? Yeah, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just to talk about a few, a few of the things that are on my mind. Um, mm -hmm. We are initiating, 
um, alluded to this to this earlier, but um, you know we're initiating a series of fireside chats and workshops and networking events that are going to be hosted at our pair headquarters in Menlo Park. Um, and you know we're really addressing this gap in terms of you know there's starting to be kind of more resources for them, but you know we're trying to do our part in terms of inspiring and motivating this next generation of you know entrepreneurial PhD students and postdocs. Um, so that's that's in the works. Um, and then you know we just actually kicked off um, you know our, our application form for a pair bio PhD uh, fellowships. Um, so that, you know, this will be a fantastic program for PhD students um, and postdocs to, you know, dive more into biotech VC, uh, to work with me, you know, directly and to kind of think, again, think about from first principles, like how do we build um, a fantastic biotech, um, you know, investing practice here. Um, and then, you know, last initiative, which I'll mention is just, um, you know, we're in the process of, you know, we hope um, recruiting and finalizing a set of operating advisors in the life sciences um, to join our team. Um, and, you know, we want this to be a, a fantastic resource um, going forward for our portfolio company founders. So before we come to a close, Eddie, yeah. we've talked about a lot today. We've gone through a number of things uh, and a few rapid fire questions just to cap things off. As you mentioned, you've been on both sides of the table, startup and investor. And so we'd just love to hear what advice you would give to scaling companies seeking to engage with pharma. Yeah, yeah, I think the the big ones for me here would be um, set realistic goals. <laughs> uh, BD takes a lot of time. Uh, deals can fall apart at any moment. You know, pharma companies are very conservative. Conservative, um, and you know, each year there are very few early stage deals that happen where it, it's actually transformative and material um, in terms of near near term value. Um, you know, I think second point is what I've learned is it's much better to create pool rather than to try to push. <laughs> um, and so, you know, kind of the saying, is, I believe, you know, companies are and technologies are bought, you know, not sold, right? Um, and then, you know, last point is just the science is important and, you know, critical, but don't forget that um, in partnering, um, you know, decisions are, are ultimately driven and made by people. Um, and it's, you know, the teams at a fundamental level need to like, actually like each other and want to work together. So thinking about those teams and thinking about people who might want to work together for the same biotech companies, you invest in the early stages, they have to go on and connect with later stage investors. Do you have any advice for companies seeking to, uh, seeking to connect with those, those VCs? Yeah. Yeah. A few thoughts here. Uh, you know, I think one get feedback early and often um, go out and, and actually talk with those later stage investors um, get to know them um, and and you know from those I, I think the second is adapt and, and iterate in the story um, and I, I think the last piece of advice is just um, you know investors can move very quickly now that I, I know I'm on the other side of the table that you know we can move um, and so if, if they're moving slow and you know, you're not hearing back. I think you, you need to understand or infer that you're not at the top of their priority list right now. So it's it's feedback that can be actionable for you in terms of how you adapt and think about your story. That's great, uh, great context for anyone listening. So we've talked a lot about the professional. Don't want to keep you much longer, but mm -hmm. we'd just love to ask one personal question before we jump off. And so how, how do you like to spend your free time? Yeah, yeah, I've mentioned that my wife and I have, you know, two young boys um, at home with a three-year-old and a one-year-old. So mm -hmm. um, a lot of our free time, you know, is really just fun chasing them around <laughs> and keeping them busy. Um, so, you know, we, we shuttle them around every weekend, you know, between various outings, uh, you know, the park or the museum, um, hiking or, you know, the zoo, um, you know, play dates and such. Uh, but beyond that, um, you know, I... Um, I enjoy playing tennis, um, so, you know, when I get the chance, I'll I try to do that when the weather's nice. Um, and then, you know, I do, en do enjoy, um, you know, tinkering, tinkering with uh, various musical instruments. Um, it's always been a hobby of mine, so, you know, l lately it's been, you know, the piano and, and the drums. Um, so. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Very, very distinct instruments, and I'm curious yeah. uh, to learn more, but 
Any other closing thoughts, shameless plugs, anything you'd like to share with the audience that we haven't covered? Yeah, yeah, shameless plugs. Um, you know, I think if you're interested in learning more about, you know, Pear, um, definitely follow Pear on, you know, LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, we have a monthly email newsletter, uh, so you can find that on our Pear website. Um, I also want to plug uh, my partner Vivian's um, fantastic uh, Pear Healthcare Playbook podcast. Um, where she interviews, you know, CEOs and entrepreneurs in the broader healthcare space um, and, you know, ask them to kind of dive deep into, um, you know, the playbook of how they built up their company. So, yeah, I would really encourage you, your uh, listeners to subscribe. Great plugs both. And thank you again, Eddie, for joining us on this absolutely fantastic episode. Your insights, your time, your willingness to share very actionable ex ex and concrete examples. It's uh, been a phenomenal conversation and I'm sure our audience thinks the same. Thank you again. Yeah, my pleasure.